So, so far we've talked about uh, households uh, as consumers. We discuss, um, given the market tightness and given the price, how many services households would like to consume, how many they are going to purchase. We also talked about the households as producers, and we said, okay, about the market, given the market tightness, given the price, how many services are they going to bring to the market? How many services um, can they expect to sell? We've seen that, and, and from these assumptions we made uh, in the model, um, we were able to compute an aggregate demand curve, an aggregate supply curve. Something we haven't talked about much is um, the price of these services. Um, the price at which services are uh, bought and sold, um, the price at which services are, uh, are traded, basically. Um, and so uh, that's what we have to uh, think about now. So if we were in a, in a Valhazian market, um, things would be pretty simple. You know, um, we, you know, in a Valhazian market, you uh, make, well, you describe a market in which that's completely centralized. Sellers come to the market, uh, buyers come to the market. Once you aggregate their preferences, you create a demand curve, a supply curve, and then there is an auctioneer who takes into account the supply, this demand, and that's going to set a price so that the supply is equal to the demand, and so that you know, uh, and you know, and they are going to do that because, of course, this gives you an efficient allocation. And um, so it's really the best mechanism that you can imagine uh, once you have a centralized market. And so um, everybody who wants to sell their goods at the uh, price set by the auctioneer will be able to do so. Anybody who wants to sell their, who wants to buy goods at the price at the market set by the auctioneer will be able to do so. And uh, you know, and, and you and you'll get an efficient allocation uh, of goods that way. Now. And you know, mathematically, the way we therefore compute the price that the auctioneer would set is to say is to try to figure out the price at which supply is equal to demand, and uh, and the price at which supply is equal to demand is what an auction auctioneer would set. Um, now, here we cannot do that because we are not dealing with a centralized market. Here we are dealing with a matching market where trades uh, occur, you know, in a in a decentralized fashion as described by the matching function. So the kind of underlying idea is, you know, sellers are spread out um, all over the place, buyers are spread out all, all over the place. Everybody, uh, you know, has different needs, different preferences, uh, are in a different location, open at different times, um, you know, and, and so it's all decentralized like this and the matching function is going to capture all this complexity and describe how buyers and sellers get together. Um, but given the decentralized nature of the market, you know, as it is in, in real life, of course, uh, you know, except for a couple of centralized market, like say a stock market or a few markets for commodities, um, in reality, markets are decentralized exactly as we described in, in, in our magic model. Um, so in a world like this, you cannot just have an auctioneer set the price because um, every, you know, every seller um, is going to set a price or even possibly, you know, if every buyer and seller pair is going to determine a price, you know, when they meet, uh, because each of these meetings is individual, it's not centralized at all. Um, so in a world like this, um, we, we cannot use this, um, we cannot assume that there is an auctioneer, or we cannot assume that it will be as if there is an auctioneer. Um, that's just not possible here. Uh, it doesn't fit with the model of the world that we're working with. And, you know, it doesn't really fit with how the world operates either. Um, so, you know, we need to model in some way um, uh, how prices are formed in each of these buyer-seller pair once they meet, uh, once they've met on the market. Um, and so there are many ways in which you could, uh, there are many ways in which you could model this. And in fact, you know, in the real world, there are also many ways in which prices uh, are formed. Uh, and 
if you think a bit about it, you realize that it's very much, it's, it's a lot of, I mean, sometimes some of it is institutional, but a lot of it is cultural. Um, so you have countries in which people meet and they always bargain over the price of the goods. Uh, and so bargaining is completely normal. Um, you have countries in which um, sellers are going to set a price and you know nobody is going to bargain about it. You just come in and you pay the price that's set. Um, you know, you have countries that are a bit in between, places that are a bit in between where you have a price that's set and, you know, maybe like customers get a discount and people who are not customers don't get a discount. Um, you know, you have places in which a price is quoted and then you're expected to tip on top of it and the amount and, you know, and there are different amount of tippings that are customaries for, um, you know, for different services or in different location. Um, you have places in which prices are somewhat regulated by the government and uh, or you know you have certain goods for which prices are somewhat regulated and therefore the price is set by uh, regulation um, so like in france for instance actually um, maybe surprisingly but only the late 70s the price of bread was always regulated um, and so every year the government would update the price for a few key bread like the baguette and like one bigger bread based on the cost of producing um, the bread. And so all bakers had to sell the bread at that price. And so that was like much more of a regulated price. Um, but so the point is that in practice, as in theory, you've got to make an assumption about how the, pri the prices are formed. Um, and in, we'll see a bit later in, in theory, there are many different assumptions you can make, but in practice, there are also many different mechanisms and customs that are used to set prices. Um, um, you know, so here, you know, because the market's not centralized and people, because the price is set once seller and buyer get together, um, you know, you just need to make an assumption about how buyers and sellers are going to get, are going to come to an agreement about the price at which a trade will occur. Um, so typically in micro models, we're happy to make assumption about utility function. We're happy to make assumption about production functions. Um, so here we also made an assumption about trade occur, how trade occurs, that was a matching function. But in addition, we also need to make an assumption about uh, prices are, how prices are set. And that's going to be what we'll introduce now. We're going to introduce um, a price norm that will describe how prices are set in all these buyer-seller um, um, pairs. Um, what sh shape and form is the price norm going to take? Um, well, in fact, it can be um, very general. Um, and um, so in theory, you know, there is really no uh, restrictions, as we'll see. And in fact, later on in, in the course, we are going to study a few uh, special case of uh, price norms. So just um, to preview a little bit. Um, what, I have, what I have in mind. Um, so you, you can make many assumptions about how prices are set. Um, so you can have, you know, something that's very common is to assume, for instance, that you have Nash bargaining um, between seller and buyer, so that's a very common um, assumption. Um, you know, something that's very close to it is that you could assume that you have surplus sharing. It's not exactly some circumstances. It's equivalent to bargaining, not always. Um, so you can have surplus sharing between buyer and seller. Uh, you could have other forms of bargaining. Um, so surplus sharing is something that Diamond assumed in one of the um, early papers. Uh, you can have other forms of bargaining, um, you know, between the seller and uh, buyers in the labor literature. You know, sometimes you have um, stolz Weibel bargaining that's assumed. Um, Holland Milgram have what they call credible bargaining. Um, so yes, you, all kinds of bargaining. Um, you could assume a price norm would be to have just a fixed price where you know, the price is just a, pa a parameter uh, of the model and it remains the same even when other parameters of the model change. 
So when we do comparative static, um, that's totally possible. Um, you know, you could have something that's more not fixed but a rigid price. And in a, in a case like this, you know, it would be your price would be a function of the parameters, and uh, and your you know your function would be such that it doesn't respond fully to our parameter move, so that qualitatively you would have a lot of the behavior that's similar to what we see with a rigid price. And we'll talk more about that. Uh, you could have something that's a competitive price. Uh, um, and by that, a competitive price, what I mean is that a price um, that would um, ensures um, that the allocation you get in your model is efficient. So that would ensure uh, aggregate efficiency. So it would be a price that um, replicates what you have in uh, when you have a competitive search uh, protocol. Uh, so you would get something that looks like competitive um, search. Something we'll, we'll talk about as well. So um, here I'm just saying in theory you can just have uh, many different ways, many different assumptions you can make about how prices are set between buyer and seller. So uh, so formally, if we want to formalize uh, to formalize this, we want to formalize the price norm. Um, we are just going to uh, we are just going to assume. Uh, that so in theory you could have different prices in all you know in all buyer seller uh, relations here because we are look you know we are working with a model in which all households are identical um, you know we're going to focus on a case where all prices in you know, all buyer seller uh, trades are going to be identical as well. That's just to keep things simple. So far, we've really um, tried to uh, have a really homogeneous model. There is no heterogeneity, no heterogeneity at all. We'll keep this assumption here. We'll assume that there is no heterogeneity in prices. We assume that all trades between buyers and sellers will have the same price for simplicity. Um, but of course, you could, you, know, you could build a more complex model in which you have heterogeneous prices um, and then you know you'll have to make assumptions about what people take into account when they decide to buy whether they're able to uh, search you know to observe prices and then pick the uh, sellers that they like to based on the prices they offer so you'll have to make different assumptions here um, but here we'll just assume that all prices are going to be the same in all uh, trades um, so we'll assume that all prices uh, given by uh, a price norm. So what that means is that there's a norm in the economy that dictates what prices are for the services. Um, and we assume that everybody is going to respect it. And the underlying assumption is that if somebody deviated from it, you know, they would be punished uh, very heavily so that nobody wants to do it. You know, if you sold a service for a price that's higher than anybody else expect you'll be punished for it uh, and so people uh, people just don't do it um, and so the price norm will just take a very general form so the price would be p uh, it's going to be a function p n the n here represents the fact that it's a norm and in general your function can depend on parameters of the model so you know, um, the price norm could depend on like some utility parameter. It could depend on some production parameter. Uh, there's really no you know no limitation. And then it can also depend, of course, on aggregate variables. And this we can simplify a bit um, because, as we'll see in the model, all aggregate variables are can actually be expressed as a function of the market tightness. So here, without loss of generality, we can simplify and in fact assume that the price P, it's a function um, price norm of X, or, well, so if it keeps the same order here, the function of the parameters of the model, 
and then x the market tightness and that's because all aggregate variable can be expressed as function of tightness as we will see in a little while so this is our, our, pri uh, our price norm uh, that can capture some other parameters of, of depend on some other parameters of the model as well as uh, the market tightness um, and so in theory we said there's just all kinds of um, price norms that you can assume in practice of course if you're building a model of a specific economy uh, what you want is that you want to assume a price norm that captures well how pricing occurs in that market so you know when you have a valrasian market uh, you just can't make any assumption like by, by uh, definition of the relevant market, it has to be that an auctioneer actually sets the price of all goods so that supply equal demand. Um, but you know, as, as we've discussed, of course, in reality, markets are decentralized, and furthermore, in reality, in different contexts, prices are set differently. So if you want to do a good job at describing well your market or describing well the economy, you want to make sure that the norm that you pick is actually going to capture how prices are set uh, in the economies that you're studying. Uh, so our goal uh, set a price norm that reflects how uh, prices are set in practice. And uh, So you want to have a price norm that's uh, empirically valid. And so of course you may wonder, well, how are prices set? How can I know that? In a little while, we're going to review evidence on how prices are set, how wages are set, because and people, economists, but other social scientists as well, have been studying and uh, how prices are set, how wages are set. They've done ethnographic studies. They've been in the field to actually see how prices are set on different markets. And so then we can use all this uh, wealth of knowledge that has been collected on how prices are set in different markets and try to um, assume a norm that's going to reflect that. We'll also see that the price norm will have implication for the behavior of the model and then we can kind of look at how the world operates in practice to try to infer properties of the price norms that the model is consistent with what we see in the real, real world but instead of making um, just an, you know instead of assuming how prices are set by making an institutional assumption says that markets are valrasian or that um, you know you have monopolistic competition or, so, or something like that, and just applying this across the board. Now we can actually um, go and and make assumptions that are as realistic as possible uh, about how prices are set, because we have that freedom uh, in the model, thing, because we have a decentralized uh, model of market in which each buyer-seller pair sets a price. So that gives us that freedom to actually, in the same way that we try to make realistic assumptions about production functions and the matching functions, we'd also want to make realistic assumptions about the price norm. 